Okay, we are going to look at discs on strings falling and discs on inclined planes rolling. Now these two problems may look very differently, but when we solve them using Newton's laws in linear motion and Newton's laws in rotational motion, we see that they solve very, very similarly. So I'm going to go ahead and set these two up and solve them through using Newton's second law. So our first one here is we, has a di we have a disc on a string that it's going to just be allowed to kind of unroll. So you can think about like a yo-yo falling. And we're going to go ahead and try and find the tension and the acceleration of this disc in terms of the mass of that disc and the acceleration of gravity. And again, this is a uniform disc, so we do know the moment of inertia is one half mr squared. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to try and find the force of friction and the acceleration of that disc as it rolls down an incline in terms of the mass of that disc, the acceleration of gravity, and the angle of that incline. Okay, so let's go ahead and set this up. So let's start over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my forces. I'm going to set up my free body diagram. So I have mg pulling it down. I have tension pulling it up. Now because this object is both angularly accelerating and linearly accelerating, what we're going to have to do is have to set up both those accelerations as positive, and then we'll have to link them together. So this is accelerating down. I like to call my acceleration a positive value, so down is going to be my positive direction. And it is angularly accelerating this way, and I'm going to have to make sure both of those are positive because I need to link them together. And how I link them together is I'm able to say that alpha is equal to the linear acceleration divided by the connecting radius. So where are those two things connected? And so since the string is connected at the outer radius here, it is the radius of my disc. If it was more of a yo-yo situation where that radius was in smaller, um, like along the, the core of it, um, that would be the radius I would be using here. All right, so now I can connect my rotational and my linear quantities. So I need to now use Newton's second law to set up both the rotational and the linear quantities. So let's go ahead and do that. So in the linear sense, the sum of the forces in the y direction here is going to cause me to have an acceleration of this mass. Now down is my positive direction, so I have mg minus tension equals ma. In my rotational direction, I'm going to sum up the torques and set it equal to i alpha. Now my axis of rotation I'm choosing here is I'm choosing the center here. The reason I'm doing that is the moment of inertia is just the moment of inertia about the center for a disk, which is one half mr squared. If I wanted to do this all in one equation um, and just use torque, I could set up my axis rotation here, but I'd have to do the parallel axis theorem as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do the method where I use these two equations. Uh, so the torques, mg is not producing any torque because it's at the axis of rotation. Tension is producing a torque, and you'll notice that it's causing a positive torque because this is my positive direction because that's the direction I cho chose as positive there. So now I have tension times its distance from the axis rotation r is equal to the moment of inertia which is one half mr squared times alpha which I'm going to substitute in for as well here is a over r. Now the reason I make a lot of these substitutions here is you'll see that because it's connected at the radius all my r's cancel out. And so now I see that the tension is equal to one half ma. I'm going to go ahead and substitute that in over here. So now I have mg minus one half ma equals ma. You'll see that the accelerations can't, or I'm sorry, the masses cancel out here. And so now I can solve for the acceleration. So I get g is equal to the acceleration plus a half acceleration gives me three halves of an acceleration. So the acceleration is two-thirds g. Good, it's less than the acceleration of gravity because it's not in free fall. There's that tension holding it back. Now I just need to go ahead and plug this in over here, and I find that my tension is going to be one-half times m times two-thirds g. Uh, the one-half and that two cancel out, so I'm left with a tension of one-third mg. So it's only supporting part of the weight. Um, one third of the weight is being supported, that leaves two thirds of the weight to give me that acceleration. Ah, go figure. All right, let's go ahead and go over here and let's take a look at now, instead of it rolling down a vertical incline, it's now going to be rolling down some sort of sloped incline. All right, but we're going to do the same setup. Let's think about what we did. So the first thing we did is we identified the accelerations. 
So we have an acceleration, a linear acceleration this way, which I will call positive, and I have a rotational acceleration this way. Again, I want to call it positive, and I want to link those two together. And so I'm able to say that alpha is equal to A divided by the connecting radius. So where is it touching my surface? At the radius of the object. Wonderful. So it's that capital R again. That's going to set us up for this cancellation we saw before. All right. So next I need to draw a free body diagram. So I got to think about what forces are acting on here. And I, because we do rotation, we need to know where are those forces acting too. So yes, I have gravity acting down from the center. I have the force of friction acting up the incline. It's resisting the object from sliding down. And it's acting at the surface and parallel with the surface. The normal force is acting at the surface and perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so those are my forces. Um, and now I just need to go ahead and set up Newton's second law in both rotation and in linear. So let's go ahead and set that up. So the sum of the forces in the x direction, I'm going to call it is equal to ma. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to rotate my coordinate system so that my acceleration is only in my x direction. I don't want to do this two-dimensional stuff. I only want it in one dimension, meaning the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero. So now I can go ahead and plug these in. Now I see I have the force of friction in the negative direction, but mg is kind of at an angle. So I do have to resolve that mg into components here. So let's go ahead and set that up. So I resolve mg into components. This angle here is theta, the same as that angle there. So that I'm looking at mg sine theta is the one that is causing it to accelerate down the incline, mg sine theta and the force of friction. If I needed it, if I needed the normal force, I could solve for it here in the y direction and set that sum of the forces equal to zero, but we don't in this case. So here I have mg sine theta minus the force of friction equals ma. In my torque problem, okay, so now I need to set up my torque problem. I have I alpha. Again, I still have a disk, so my disk is going to be 1 half mr squared. And what forces are causing torques? Well, mg isn't producing any torque because it's at the axis rotation. The normal force isn't perpendicular, so it's not producing any torque. Only the force of friction is producing torque. So I have the force of friction times its distance from the axis to rotation r. You'll notice those are perpendicular, so I don't have to do any cross products or resolve them or anything. Uh, and so I'm left with an i value of 1 half m r squared. And again, I'll make my substitution of a over r here. The reason we make that substitution there is all of those r's cancel again for me because the connecting radius and the radius of the object are the same. So now I see the force of friction is equal to 1 half ma. I hope we're seeing some similarities here. I had tension was 1 half ma. I had mg minus tension equals ma. I have mg. The only difference is here I have the sine of theta mixed in there. Okay. So I'm going to make that substitution here. So I have mg sine theta minus 1 half ma equals ma. All the masses cancel again. All right. So my masses all cancel. And so I'm left with, all right, so I got to move this 1 half a over. It gives me 3 halves a. So I have g sine theta equals 3 halves a. And so I'm left with 2 thirds g sine theta equals a. And I can find my force of friction here then just by substituting this in. And so I have the force of friction is equal to 1 half m times this right here, which is my 2 thirds g sine theta. The 2 and the 1 half cancel out. And so I'm left with the force of friction is equal to 1 third mg sine theta. So what you should see here is the similarity is that this doesn't have a sine of theta. Why not? Because what's the angle for this incline that's vertical? 90 degrees. What's the sine of 90 degrees? 1. So in reality, these are very similar problems. And so they solve very similar ways. 